Over a dozen Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails have gone on a hunger strike against their administrative detention. What are their demands? Venezuela has won a lawsuit to recover frozen assets worth over $1.5 billion from Portugal. Why was the country denied this money all these years? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. So do keep watching and if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Our first story is from Palestine where over a dozen prisoners have gone on a hunger strike. They are protesting their illegal detention. We have talked about this administrative detention whereby Israel can hold Palestinians for months on end in jail without charge or trial. The number of administrative detainees has rapidly increased in recent months. To understand some of these issues, we go to Abdul. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us on this show. We have often talked about the question of Palestine, the question of administrative detention, and in fact, the struggles of Palestinian prisoners who have been very defiant. So could you maybe tell, take us a bit through what this latest uh, hunger strike is about and what are the demands? Basically, administrative detainees, uh, and there is a difference between administrative detainees and uh, uh, prisoner, basically, uh, which we can talk about later, but primarily are on hunger strike. Some of them are there for or on hunger strike for more than two weeks now, but uh, some of them have joined recently. So you can say there is a relay uh, with which more and more uh, Palestinian administrative detainees are joining uh, their independent hunger strike. Basically, demanding uh, uh, the uh, the end of their administrative detention, and also uh, representing representing the uh, demands of the rest of the Palestinian prisoners, which have basically uh, suffered because of uh, the Israeli prison conditions, uh, bad Israeli prison conditions. The treatment of the Palestinians have been inhuman and has been reported many uh, times before. Uh, how, uh, uh, particularly when the Ben Gvir became the uh, uh, police minister in Israel, uh, the extremist uh, minister, basically he has passed certain orders which basically deprive uh, Palestinian prisoners in general of certain basic rights uh, uh, of hygiene, meeting with their relatives, uh, and so on and so forth. So, demanding the restoration of all. Uh, rights to the prisoners in Palestine and their immediate release from release of the administrative detainees from the prison. These are, you can say, two major demands with which uh, more than a dozen of Palestinians are on indefinite hunger strike. Uh, when we talk about administrative detention, the difference between administrative detention and uh, general prison uh, prisoners in, Pal in Israel in Israeli jail, basically talking about the prisoners who have, who are basically arrested without and uh, kept in prison without being charged or tried, uh, trial for more than six months. And, and this six months is a period which is extendable uh, several times. So some of them who are on hunger strike are there for, uh, they're inside the Israeli prison for more than a year now. And some of them are even uh, there for more than uh, uh, Many years, for many years also. So uh, this is the primary uh, uh, issue at this moment uh, when we talk about the hunger strike. Right, Abdul, that, uh, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I just wanted to also talk about the larger question of administrative detention. You described some of the details, but I think this is also a historic high in the number of people who are administrative detainees right now. And could you maybe also take us through some of the policies uh, that... You know, the general nature of this government, rather, which is actually contributed. We know that administrative detention is only one part of the violence. There are also the attacks on places like Janin, the raids on Gaza. So could you also maybe take us through the larger political situation that is spurring this increase in the number of administrative detentions? Exactly. You see, uh, this year uh, already, this is only the uh, eighth month of the year, and the Israeli authorities have issued, according to the uh, Palestinian News Agency, more than 1900 orders of administrative detention. At this moment, there are more, hundred, uh, more, more than 1200 Palestinians who are uh, arrested uh, under the preventive det administrative detention. So you can see this is uh, the historically high number. 
this uh, of course there has always been 100 or 200 Palestinians who have been uh, uh, arrested under administrative detention in the past. But ever since this new government, uh, the ultra-right new government led by Netanyahu, but also backed by settlers uh, like Ben Guir and Smotrich and others, basically uh, represents the most extreme uh, uh, Zionist elements in Israel who, have, who completely deny the existence of Palestinians and their right to self-determination. And there even some of them have denied their basic human rights uh, and said it in public uh, domain. So um, ever since this government has come to power, the numbers are increasing every month or every year. Uh, in fact, this, this month, uh, more than 370 people have been arrested under administrative detention. So uh, yeah, so the, when we say that, what is the larger nature of administration, administrative detention, this is one of the few laws, uh, one of, Israel is one of the few countries in the world which has a system. Uh, Despite the fact that the international human rights groups and even the UN has uttered that this amounts to uh, uh, Ill uh, illegality in terms of prisoners' rights, this basically violates basic human rights. This is all. This also amounts to some kind of uh, uh, violation of uh, uh, the, the laws related to occupation. Despite all those uh, uh, comments made by the international human rights agencies and groups. Israel continues uh, to practice, uh, and, and, and as I said before, the number of people who are arrested under administrative detention is increasing. So you can see that this Israeli administration, and particularly this Israeli administration, feels com complete uh, uh, lack of accountability, complete impunity when it comes to uh, adhering to basic uh, uh, rights, which, uh, 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 which is required even under uh, occupation. And, and that is the reason that the practices like administrative detention uh, are increasing. If you just uh, see, and by the way, this hunger strike is not for the first time that Palestinians are, uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners are doing. There had been different other instances in the past where uh, dozens of Palestinian prisoners have sat on indefinite hunger strike. Some of them have also died. Uh, that also shows, for example, this year in May, uh, uh, one of the prisoners died uh, after uh, being on indefinite hunger strike for more than 87 days. And Israeli administration refused to uh, acknowledge uh, his demands and basically take care of his condition, a deteriorating health condition. So, of course, the, every Palestinian prisoner has the right to protest uh, the administrative detention. But uh, it is also should be noted that the Israel has often uh, ignored such uh, protests, and that has led to the death of dozens of Palestinians in the past. So uh, that is one uh, aspect of it. The another uh, important aspect is, uh, as I said before, Ben Gvir. Ever since Ben Gvir came to power, uh, ever since Ben Gvir became minister under Netanyahu government uh, last year, he has basically started a kind of a vilification campaign against all the Palestinian prisoners, calling them terrorists without any uh, 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 legal proof and, and, and kind of carrying out a campaign that all of them, those who are in the prison, need not to be released. They should never be released from prison. They need to, uh, he has said it, it sounds, uh, it sounds uh, absurd, but he has said that they, they need to be kept in the prison until they they died. So this kind of uh, inhuman uh, uh, regime, which is there in Israel, in that context, Palestinian prisoners taking uh, uh, taking out indefinite hunger strikes, taking out their protests, and carrying their indefinite hunger strikes shows that how determined they are uh, in resisting uh, the occupation, no matter how brutal uh, the occupation is. Thank you, Abdul, for shining light on that very important struggle that is taking place in Israeli jails by Palestinian prisoners. It has been going on for quite a long time, and it does look like that determination you talked about is still very much there. Thank you so much. We next go to Venezuela, where the legitimate government of President Nicolas Maduro won a lawsuit filed against the Portuguese bank Novo Banco in Lisbon, and it recovered more than US dollars, 1.5 billion in assets. These assets had been frozen in 2019, 
at the height of the US-led campaign to bring regime change to Venezuela. Anish describes how the money belonging to the people of Venezuela was frozen and its impact. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So could you maybe first take us through some of the details of the case? That's quite a lot of money that belongs to the legitimate government of Venezuela. So why were they denied? Why were they blocked from accessing it? Well, the, the simplest re uh, reason here is that there were U.S. sanctions and it's basically on the directive of the U.S. sanctions that the, that the bank of Banco uh, actually uh, froze the funds uh, to begin with. And because obviously the bank itself is uh, held, has a majority stake by a U.S. financing corporation, and so pretty much that was the reason that was given. Uh, it was also primary part of partly because of uh, obviously Portuguese being part of the EU bloc that also imposes sanctions on the Venezuelan government. Uh, and and we have to remember that until recently, in 2000, uh, since 2019, the governments, these two governments, and like many of the Western governments at the time, actually held. Uh, a very tenuous and a very pr a problematic position of not recognizing uh, the legitimate government uh, that was uh, that obviously comes out of uh, Nicolas Maduro and instead uh, trying to recognize Juan Guaido as the president of uh, being the uh, uh, being somebody who was not even in Venezuela at the time of being supposedly elected and so this was the whole uh, situation that existed and pretty much. This was this is just one part of uh, a sit, uh, what the Venezuelan government often calls a hybrid war that was uh, waged against it uh, from multiple quarters. Uh, and freezing of funds was just one part of it. Uh, there were also freezing of complete entire assets. Uh, there were over uh, close to a thousand refineries in North America that were just completely cut off uh, from uh, you know Venezuela's PDVSA. And we also have a situation where, uh, obviously, we, we have reported this, uh, the gold, uh, um, over $1.5 billion uh, worth of gold reserves being, you know, held captive, essentially, by the Bank of England, uh, even at a time when the government there has started, uh, you know, has dropped uh, Guaido as, uh, you know, this recognized president of Venezuela and have started, you know, dealing with the Maduro government. Uh, so we are looking at a continuing war of not just sanctions, but also this sort of embargo, an economic embargo that is being put up, where obviously uh, Venezuela being a very export, uh, at the before sanctions was an export-oriented uh, economy, resource-oriented economy, and obviously it will have multiple assets in, across different banks, much like any other country of, with a similar economic system. And so they made use of that to actually hold the entire economy and its people captive uh, at a time when they actually needed it. And uh, we also need to remember that these funds that in Novanko was actually part of the deal between the, of the opposition, the right-wing opposition, and the Venezuelan government to actually kickstart, uh, you know, a program to you know recover an economic recovery program that can act, that can actually uh, you know maybe uh, recover some of the damages that were uh, inflicted during the pandemic and obviously the fact that the sanctions were uh, you know exacerbated the situation there so this this is the entire uh, you know context that we are looking at and obviously this victory comes as a major major uh, victory for the venezuelan government which will which is obviously fighting similar legal battles for its funds for its uh, you know reserves in different countries right anish interesting you mentioned that because i think that if you look at 2019 when you're talking about you know juan guaido's self proclaimed declaration of declaration of himself as a self proclaimed president uh, the kind of sanctions that the united states and all their allies imposed the attempt to take the venezuelan embassy in the us for instance by guaido's activists and nearly 4 years down the line you see that almost every element of that strategy has failed there's a lot of regional integration there is a lot of you know venezuela is very much back in the center of politics of diplomatic relations in Latin America and there, there, of course the US continues to apply very horrific pressure but that campaign seems to have really not worked at all in some senses. Yes, uh, I think the, the, the primary purpose of this campaign was basically to cripple not just the Venezuelan economy but also punish its people for choosing a government that the West did not like. And that was primarily the reason why uh, this entire sanctions existed. They were pretty much aware that it was like 
even if you look at a history of sanctions, it doesn't really affect the elite or the people that they supposedly intend to target. It actually affects the uh, the bottom uh, poor of uh, any economy or any country, and it actually affects uh, you know access to uh, you know means of livelihood, access to essential goods, medicines, you know all sorts of things that actually is necessary for any you know civilized uh, world uh, in society to. Uh, continue to be, uh, you know, continue living, forget about prospering. So this is something that they were very well aware of. And we saw that barbarity of that uh, sort of san sanctions during the COVID-19 pandemic when there were, you know, even refusal to, uh, for months actually, refusal to even allow uh, medical supplies uh, or, uh, you know, encourage medical supplies to actually reach Venezuela, which desperately needed them. Uh, you know, at the time, and this sort of uh, uh, you know situation was exacerbated. Like the obviously, Venezuela was going through a crisis of its own. It was going through some a level of crisis of you know of, of, of multi for multiple reasons. But the fact that these sanctions, these artificially created uh, crises, uh, hit it, it actually brought it back behind uh, on, on several aspects, and especially uh, you know prevented its after pandemic efforts. So this uh, was primarily uh, uh, an attempt to obviously, you know, punish uh, a people, a nation for something, for a political decision that may even change tomorrow. They do not know that, but definitely they do not care for that. They do not care for what the people uh, might or might not do tomorrow. They want some, they wanted the results and they didn't get it. And that was the kind of outcome that we saw. But definitely that did not work because obviously the government uh, was not built on very shaky grounds. The government was, uh, you know, rock solid. It had constitutional bank backing and the right wing opposition did not have this level of popular support and backing that, you know, the government or, the, uh, or President Maduro had. And that is something, and obviously the fact that Guaido was pretty much a non-political non-entity back in Venezuela and was only uh, known even for more, to most Venezuelans after he declared himself as a president was something uh, that the West did not really understand at that point or probably underestimated. It was poorly planned thing, obviously, on their part to think that they could actually, uh, you know, make a country kneel before them just uh, like the way they used to do, obviously, uh, during the Cold War era or, uh, you know, even the post-Cold War uh, period of whatever the unipolar world order that existed. So that obviously, so the fact that this court case happened and the ruling happened clearly shows that that is definitely not going to work any longer. And, you know, the Baduro government is already talking about how, uh, you know, they are going to further pursue uh, litigation to, uh, to see if the bank and the government of Portugal were well aware of the kind of damage that it will do to its people and might even go for litigation on those grounds. It might also go use that as grounds for their litigation against the Bank of England uh, for their uh, frozen gold reserves, and obviously against the United States, where uh, you know multiple hundreds and hundreds of refineries are being held essentially captive and being being taken over, and in some cases even confiscated by the United States government completely illegally, and uh, and pretty much nothing is being done about it other than the fact that Venezuela has to voice its position. So these factors will obviously come uh, in handy. This ruling definitely comes in handy in future uh, struggle of Venezuelan people and, and the government officer. Right, Anish, thank you so much for uh, talking to us about that. And uh, like we discussed, while, of course, the campaign, the US-led campaign must uh, has failed, we need to remember, like you said, that uh, reports say tens of thousands of additional deaths taking place due to these sanctions, people's families, livelihoods, all of them getting affected so severely. So I think these are aspects that can never be forgotten. So thank you so much for talking to us. And that's all we have today in this weekend edition of Daily Debrief. We'll be back on Monday with more stories from across the world, more updates. Do go to, go to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Visit our YouTube channel to see videos from around the world. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button.